And this one, double mic. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to Guelph Museums. Uh, my name is Ken Irvin. I'm the education coordinator at Guelph Museums. And I'd like to thank the Laurier Center for the study of Canada for being a partner in all of our uh, military lectures. And I'd like to thank our speaker tonight for coming up. Thank you Pardeep for coming out. We're really looking forward to your talk. Uh, before we begin, I have to put on my glasses. And we would like to acknowledge that uh, Guelph is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabe peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Through the Between the Lakes Purchase Number Three Treaty of 1792, the Mississaugas of the Credit ceded to the British Crown over 3 million acres of land between Lakes Huron, Ontario, and Erie. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Uh, Guelph Museums continues to build our knowledge and relationships about the land, its history, and its peoples. Uh, this commitment informs all that we do at Guelph Museums. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Jay Group, who is uh, a new um, board member with us and a uh, former employee at Guelph Museums, and she's going to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you for that, Ken. Um, uh, yes, uh, hello everyone. And uh, as Ken mentioned, my name is Jagrup Mehta, and I'm currently serving on the advisory committee for uh, Guelph Museums, and I was a former employee. Um, just echoing Ken's warm welcome to everybody who's come out tonight, and a very heartfelt satriakal to all of my Sikh brothers and sisters that are attending in person today or tuning in online. Um, as many of us will know, um, a few days ago, we celebrated the auspicious occasion of Vasaki, uh, which is the most significant festival in the Sikh cal calendar and traditionally marks the harvest season and the birth anniversary of Khalsa. And on behalf of myself and the museum, I would like to wish the community luck, luck, vadanya, or many congratulations on this happy occasion. Um, on a personal note, I'm grateful to the museum for their efforts to include the Sikh community in the military lecture series to coincide with Sikh Heritage Month. Um, following conversations I had last year with the museum on the relevance of Sikh military history to the local community, it's heartening to see them take proactive steps to celebrate the diversity and richness of our local community and demonstrate how, respons how responsive they are as an institution by addressing the historic erasure of relevant six stories from the museum narrative. This includes the story of Private Bukhan Singh, one of the first Sikh soldiers enlisted in the Canadian Army in the First World War and an early Sikh pioneer to Ontario. Um, many of us will know Bukhan Singh is buried just down the road in, Canada, in uh, Kitchener and has a connection to um, our own local hero, John McRae, having spent time at his number three Canadian hospital. Uh, with that said, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce a remarkable individual who has made significant contributions both to the Sikh community and the broader Canadian society. Pradeep Singh Nagra is a man of many talents and accomplishments. He's an avid collector of antique cars and motorcycles and serves as the director of the Sikh Heritage Museum of Canada. In this role, he has hosted three Canadian ministers of defense and has been instrumental in highlighting the significant contributions of Sikh soldiers to the Canadian military. Um, as an award-winning historian and artifact collector, Pradeep has amassed an impressive collection of over 2,000 Sikh soldiers, uh, toy Sikh soldiers, I must add. <laughs> as, uh, <laughs> he's not just collecting You don't want to go soldiers. underneath my house and see what's buried <laughs> under there, right? <laughs> yeah, he's not creepy. Um, he has traveled around the world presenting and speaking about the honor, valor, and legacy of the Sikh military tradition, including at prestigious venues such as the Military Muse Museums of Calgary and the Pentagon. 
Pradeep's love, exactly, wow, right? Um, Pradeep's love of sports has also led him to many athletic achievements, including being a high school tennis champion, elite ball hockey player, Boston Marathon qualifier, and a national level boxer. In fact, his remarkable journey as a boxer has even been immortalized in a Hollywood movie called Tiger. Uh, Pradeep's work and service has been recognized and valued by his community and country, as is evidenced by the many accolades he's received, including the YMCA Canada Peace Medal, University of Toronto Arbor Award, Region of Peel Chairs Award for Community Justice, Auxiliary Constable of the Year with Re uh, Peel Regional Police, and the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal. Furthermore, Pradeep serves on the Board of Trustees for the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and is committed to reconciliation. So without further ado, please, welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming Pradeep Singh Nagra, an exceptional individual who embodies the best of our community and nation. Vaheguruji ka khalsa, Vaheguruji ki fat. I just found a new bio. <laughs> And, and it's interesting because I said uh, that was some major research uh, because nowhere did I talk about how many defense ministers we've hosted at the museum and you pretty much knew from uh, Jason Kenney um, to Harjit Sajjan to Anita Anand. So yeah, the last three defense ministers have all come through the museum. Um, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be here because uh, at the end of the day, and, and you know, I, I also work for a school board. I do a lot of uh, presentations uh, to students and schools and stuff like that as well. And that's where I always feel home, right? Uh, to me, that can be kind of Instagram, Twitter stuff for people, right? And uh, to me, th th this is the space I'd like to be in. And this is what's most important to me because uh, it's not about what I've, what I've done and where I've been. It's what I'm prepared to do today and tomorrow that I want to be valued and judged on, right? Because that's the past, relatively speaking. And, and saying that is, when I come into these kind of spaces, I feel like I'm coming into community, right? And, and, uh, and then I also feel honored that uh, here it is on a Thursday night um, and you wanna give uh, some of your time just to, for lack of a better word, hang out with me. And we're gonna have some conversations. We're gonna uh, learn some new pieces. And, and fundamentally, uh, you know, as executive director of Security Museum of Canada, and that's on a volunteer basis as well, because I work as a superintendent with the Halton District School Board right now as the human rights and equity advisor. And people often ask, um, so what's at the Security Museum of Canada? And I said, Canadian history through a sick lens. That's all, nothing more, nothing less. It is Canadian history through a sick lens is what you're gonna find at the Security Museum of Canada. And so similarly, this presentation is gonna be going through those lenses as well, because that's been the challenge as been shared in, in part of the intro, that there's been some major, major erasure and there's no grounds for it. And there's consequences because of that erasure. There's huge consequences for all Canadians, not, not, not just the Canadians who are not represented, but for others who have no idea of what I call a more accurate and inclusive representation of who we are as a nation. And so hopefully this presentation will start sh uh, shedding a little bit more light about what does it authentically mean to have a Canadian experience that's a little bit more accurate and inclusive of who we are as a nation and as a people. Thank you very much for the welcome of the traditional lands. It's fundamentally important because the story that I'm sharing is a story on, uh, uh, on Turtle Island. And, and so I understand my social location with respect to reconciliation and the responsibility around uh, uh, through to reconciliation as well. And, um, and for me, it's never a presentation. Uh, it, it's a gathering and, and we're gonna reflect, we're gonna share, we're gonna question. And, and I can tell you my journey as well. From kindergarten right through university and being told I am educated because I got a degree Never once, never once in all of my education was I ever shown a picture of somebody who looks like me serving in the wars. Never was I ever shown a picture of somebody who looks like me as part of what we define as the pioneer experience in Canada. And I can tell you, 
that my first exposure, I was angry, happy, sad, frustrated. I had every single emotion go through me. Why wasn't I taught this? Why didn't I know this? I can't believe all those pieces that went through. But one thing I committed to myself that there was never going to be another day as long as I'm alive that I'm not going to be engaging this, what I call net new knowledge that I had. It's a responsibility. And it'll continue to be a responsibility. And that's the fundamental reason of why I also share my time out in community. It's part of our civic obligation and responsibility. And I say that because after I've spoken, it now becomes your responsibility. You can leave the space and never, never again talk about anything that we shared tonight. Or you can be a community historian and ambassador of this social capital. And I say this because when Don Cherry decides to go on national television and says, you people come to our country and he's talking about the poppy, that's the consequence of not knowing history and knowledge. Of, of what I'm going to be sharing. That's the consequences of it. Because he had no right to. Canada as a nation entered the war in 1915. We had a few soldiers go overseas and, and start participating in it. But fundamentally as a nation, people who looked like me were there in September of 1914 less than two months after the start of World War I. And in fact, every single historical account has said, we turned the tide of the war. The outcome would have been different because at that moment, when we arrived, Germany already had the upper hand. The war was about to end. And so these, 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 these national level of, of, of knowledge is not accurate. It's not inclusive of the real story. Because one of the most famous poems when we talked about Dr. McCrae from Guelph and in Flanders and poppies. My people were there before Canada entered the war, serving in Flanders. Battle of Ypres, I can go on and on and on. And so that's the cost to all of us. It does us a disservice. And so I hope that we can just shed some light because it's only about 40 minutes. Right? It's people who've written books and done documentaries on, on this information, but enough to, for us to leave with a greater sense of pride as Canadians. And so if we can do that, then, then I, I think I achieved uh, uh, the ultimate goal of, of why we gathered here today. As you've seen with the title of the presentation, and I think the blurb that I had shared that probably went out to community uh, advertising this event, um, Bole So Nahal. Bole So Nahal, meaning whoever utters shall be fulfilled, is a Jakarta or a war cry or a clarion call of Sikhs given by our 10th Guru, Guru Gobind Singh. And I'm sure if I make that call, I will know what's gonna come afterwards. So let's give it a try. Bole Sonihal. I was right. Sat Siri Agal. Bolle Sonihal Sat Siriakal. Which means one will be blessed eternally who says that God is the ultimate truth. The Jakarta expresses the Sikh belief that all victory belongs to God. And I'm going to contextualize something interesting here. Sometimes when we do this presentation, even within 
my community or the larger South Asian community, so within the Sikh community or the large South Asian community, sometimes I get challenged and we get challenged, my friends and colleagues who are engaged in some of this work, specifically around the military tradition, especially, for example, talking generally around the military tradition, especially around World War I and II. And they say, but party, why do you want to, for lack of better, and I put in quotes, because there's nothing glorifying about sharing, there's nothing glor glorifying about World War I or II or war in general at any given time. But speaking about the valor, right, the sacrifice, the service. And one, one, one of the uh, reference points that gets used was, why, why do you want to even speak about, about our contributions? We're slaves. I said, slaves? Who? Six? It's 2023. Never in the history of our community have we been slaves to anyone, any event, or any circumstance. And I'll tell you the reference point that will solidify this positionality of mine. Every single six soldier that served in World War I and World War II, the last thing that a soldier does in entering service is literally sign their name on the dotted line of the attestation papers. Every single Sikh soldier signed their name as a sovereign. Even Bukhan. For my community, when I use this term gold, we relatively know that Bukhan was a bans, or sometimes when we anglicize and say banes. But Bukhan Singh signed, up, signed off as a Singh. And so did every single other Sikh soldier. Every single one of them. We went in as a sovereign people. And that's important to know. Because it sets a context that, that even when we are engaging and participating, we are participating, and they've called, for example, World War I and II the Great War for Civilization and our responsibility. But we take on our responsibility as sovereign. And I say that because we had a chance to do uh, a coordinated Remembrance Day service. It was the first time uh, a, a local uh, military troop uh, was doing their uh, traditional Remembrance Day so-called church service. And they did it in a Gurdwara. We, we coordinated with uh, the Scarborough Gurdwara. And um, so we had a Toronto regiment come and uh, it was talked, uh, uh, the title too of how we presented that was Faith and War. And, and again, I, I could sit here for days, but I'm just shedding some little nuggets. Got some beautiful pictures where uh, from World War I in Flanders, a church service is happening. And who's guarding the church service? Sixer, right? And so, and so even, even in uh, this picture, it's interesting. I, the continuation of this picture, because the, the six soldiers are carrying uh, our current guru, the last guru, the Guru Granth Sahib, our scripture. And I have a continuation of this picture because they're marching. And, you know, it's interesting because if, if we just look outside the window, our eyes can see deep and far. And so imagine what this lens is looking at and you can go as far as you want to look through the lens and make an eye and you see nothing. And then so, so the, the, how far they're walking in for lack of a better word in nothingness and guess where they're walking to as part of this journey, a divan, a service in the desert. And I have an actual original photograph of this regiment hosting a uh, faith service in the desert uh, as they're marching. And why is it why it's important is uh, we even have letters um, from, for example, Wariam Singh, right? Um, and, and they say, you know, where do you get your spirit from, right? This is the foundational spirit, right? The Jakarta is, is, is what would be said by a Sikh soldier at any given time during the war 
as they're getting ready for battle or are in battle. It's that joy and ecstasy of the call that they're engaging in the war. And these pieces have so many layers attached to them. Because some of us might remember in 1990, Canada was losing its mind because some pretty looking sick gentleman with a turban and a beard wanted to join the RCMP, okay? And we're just losing our mind on it. And that's because we had no social capital enough to be able to counter argue and saying, are you kidding me? This is not to undermine the RCMP, what it does. I serve with Pure Regional Police as well. And you know, there's OPP and there's a lot of police forces around here. But I can serve in the war in one and two with nothing more on my head than my turban. And I can't be driving around in a car issuing speeding tickets with my turban on. Like, are you kidding me? Am I missing something here? Right? But those are important narratives to have an understanding when those things become part of our daily fodder. And that's why these, all these layers set context to what is happening. I can start from uh, the geopolitical and theological areas and talking about because uh, the area of Punjab and stuff, but because the time limit of today's presentation, I'm just, you know, there's gonna be some homework for all of us anyway to, to kind of set and set some context. Uh, but, but if you look at the Punjab region, which today is divided between Pakistan and India, um, uh, Indus civilization and valley area is the origins of the, of the Sikh faith, the Khalsa order. And uh, it, it, prime real estate, prime real estate. Everybody needed that because it was the Northwest Passage. It was the only land access uh, that, that uh, different uh, countries had if they wanted to kind of come into uh, that region. And Punjab and the fertile lands of, of, of Punjab and the textiles and Silk Road, and I can just go on and on and on of why this region uh, was, was, was so valued, let alone the people and the inhabitants of that area. Um, so, so by the nature of, of uh, the geopolitics of that, uh, we as a community uh, always uh, were, were so-called in battle. Theologically speaking, uh, we're, every day we're in battle uh, to fight against injustice, tyranny, and oppression. And, and, and so this concept of, of, of battle or so-called fighting has never been far. And sometimes it takes the form that we're gonna be sharing here around the military tradition itself. And so the Anglo-Sikh Wars were a series of 1840s conflicts between the British East India Company and the Sikh Empire. There were actually two Anglo-Sikh Wars. The first war took place between 1845 and 1846, and the second between 1848, 1849. Anybody know who was the, the uh, British Prime Minister around this time period? Who actually started the war against my community? Can you believe that the Sikh community was fighting the largest empire in the world at that time? That's what this is. The Anglo-Sikh Wars is the Sikh community fighting against the largest empire in the world, the British Empire. I said policing. Anybody know the origins of policing? Who is the prime minister? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying. Ah, Peel. Peelers, right? Because remember, right? The Bobbies, Sir Robert Peel, right? So that, that's where the term Bobbies come from in England in terms of the Oscars. because they were known as Bobby's boys, right? Short term for Robert, Bob, right? Or they're known as Peelers. And guess what? If you want to know ironies of ironies, the Sikh Heritage Museum of Canada is located in the region of Peel. <laughs> <laughs> I serve a Peel Regional Police. So this is kind of the individual I have to blame for why we still struggle for sovereignty as a people. Well, what's interesting is he's writing some communications and he says, to Lord Harding, the Governor General of India, after the Battle of uh, Fariza Shah against the Sikhs, your loss has been very severe. It demonstrates the extent of the danger and the necessity of unparalleled exertion. 
We are astonished at the numbers, the power of concentration, and the skill and courage of the enemy. Who is the enemy? The six. And that's how we're being written about. And we have a, a lot of original documents uh, of, of uh, newspaper articles from London Illustrated Times to a number of other published places. And it's unbelievable. Um, you know, they're saying we've never been so matched in either military science or bravery on the field as we have been with the six, right? Um, talks about the zeal and the zest for which we engage. Um, and, and so it gets to an interesting point then. 18, 18 actually, we'll just wait for that for a moment. Uh, after, after the anglo sikh Wars, England now has literally solidified its hold on the totality because that was the last bastion that was left for it to become British India was to conquer the Sikhs and the Punjab. And the Punjab at that time stretched east to west, literally up to D Delhi, all the way to the Afghan border. All the way up to the Afghan border was part of the Sikh kingdom, uh, the Sikh empire. And then, so what happened was there was a localized mutinies that started happening a little bit um, in the 1850s. And what's interesting is, again, has a great interesting connection to, to us. In fact, uh, I was passing by some of, uh, some of these localities in Ontario because people don't know when we've anglicized the name. How many people know of Del High, Ontario? <laughs> Someone else want to tell them how it should be pronounced? Dili. <laughs> Delhi is actually Dili, right? Lucknow, yeah? And you see on the screen where those names come from? Quite interesting, isn't it? Who would have known that I had the exact same medal right over here? What we call the mutiny medal to six soldiers as well. And so here, the very first black recipient of the Victoria Cross in Canada won his Victoria Cross alongside six in these battles. In fact, two of the first three Victoria Cross winners of Canada won them in the battles of Lucknow and Delhi. Hence, some of the town names that we have around here. And so that sets us up to a really interesting scenario. I think now it's about 15 to 17 years ago, a letter came up on auction. And the letter was from 1867. Uh, anybody know what was going on in 1867? This is a Canadian history test, everything I'm talking about, <laughs> if we haven't figured it out yet. Kind of, yeah, yeah. We were a country in the landmass. We just decided that there were the two founders because it was lost, I guess, somewhere, right? And 1867, the BNA Act was being signed. By who? Johnny McDonald. So what happens? He writes a letter. War will come someday between England and the United States, and India can do us a yeoman service by sending an army of six Gurkhas across the Pacific to San Francisco and holding that beautiful and immortal city with the surrounding California as security for Montreal and Canada. 1867, no Twitter, no Facebook, no Instagram, and Sir John A. Macdonald, who's gonna become the very first prime minister of Canada is speaking about us. Interesting, powerful. And you see where that legacy comes from, from the articles I talked about, because Sir John A. Macdonald would have been somebody that was probably well-read, access to, would have seen some of those communications and stuff. And what a reputation.
look who he wants. I didn't have enough money, then I didn't buy the letter on auction. But it's a great, interesting piece of Canadian sick history. I need to set the context because we also know, because uh, we started this presentation off talking about reconciliation and understanding that while I speak about this story, I need to also reference uh, the harm that was caused uh, by individuals like Sir Johnny McDonald and, and Ryerson and a number of other people and, and uh, the laws, um, uh, the value system. And I say value system because um, anyone in a position of leadership uh, would have a responsibility on the language and words and choice and how they describe a people and a community. And so you look at the totality of that and we, and we cannot uh, hide from that reality to put this in context uh, as I speak of John A. McDonald. But that's fascinating. And what's happening is now, remember this, this, this geopolitical context I told you? There's no such thing as India right now as I'm speaking of this time period. It's called British India. And the British have a pretty good empire, pretty vast empire. And they need people to take care of those spaces. And so who did they choose to be the frontline representative of the British in the military and the armies in their colonies? Us in Hong Kong, right? Singapore and a whole bunch of other places. We have original documents and stuff that, that show the Sikh community serving as police officers and in the military and stuff. Um, and so the military tradition was just actually even getting so-called bigger and stronger within this concept of empire. And in uh, 1897, there was, there was uh, a lot of battles happening in the Northwest frontier. Because remember that, 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 that was an area that was constantly in battle, not saying up for grabs, but wanted, desperately wanted. And in fact, again, when it comes to erasure, does anybody kind of recognize this person? Churchill. Churchill. Was considered one of the greatest military minds? Yeah, I, I said consider one of the greatest military, depending on which historian, which context, and all the rest of it. And there's, there's, there was a movie just a few years back that came out. Yeah? Called The Greatest Mind? About Churchill? Oh, no, sorry. Darkest Hour. Yeah. Darkest, Darkest Hour. Hour, sorry. Called The Darkest Hour. Again, here's where the erasure happens. If anybody's seen it or is going to see it, I will guarantee you, you won't see somebody who looks like me. But when you pick up the Time Life commemorative book that was published when he passed away, it talks about he started his military career off in 1897 in the Northwest frontier and all the battles along there with sick regiments. But Erasure won't tell you that even when this movie comes out, all that will get skipped somehow for some way. And he had such a love and affinity of the Sikh community that when he was going on international uh, conferences and mission stuff, he, saw, he always asked um, to be guarded by Sikhs. But we wouldn't know that. We wouldn't know that what's happening around 1897. 1897 was also another uh, important time for Queen Victoria. It was her diamond jubilee. Mm. A lot of pomp, a lot of pomp for the Jubilee. And the six soldiers were well represented as part of the Jubilee celebrations all over the place. And whether it was the Malay State Guys or the Punjab Calvary, you just name it, right? And so part of 1897, as they were going around the empire, including Canada, um, this is where some of the first exposure of, of the six uh, came to Canada. Not as a settler community, just as part of those pieces, but the community already was 
in part entrepreneurial and already was becoming diasporic because of the role that we're playing um, within the empire. And so they thought, ha, ah, this is another place we should come and hang out. And they did. And what's interesting is that that is what we call a buggery badge. Buggery, bug is another term for turban. It's the Punjabi term for turban. And that buggery badge is actually what our logo for the Sikh Heritage Museum is, is created out. It's the exact same buggery badge. And in the middle, we put the maple leaf because we want to honor both the military and pioneer heritage tradition. Because this is a picture from about 1907, 1908 in Vancouver. And there's a number of pictures we have and a number of newspaper articles because of the discrimination we started facing over here, they're pretty much throwing their medals uh, into the garbages and burning them. Because it was like Muhammad Ali's story when it comes to human rights. We can win the gold medal for you. You can sing the national anthem. You can be proud, but I come back to that land for which I just won the gold medal and I can't drink in the same fountain, sit equally in the same seat. There's a disconnect there. We're serving the crown and the empire. And when I say serve, I don't mean like I've already put the context as slaves, but I'm just talking about just like, you know, if we're, if we're, technically we, we talk about Harjit Sajjan, uh, right? As a defense minister, what he said, he's the slave of, of Canada or, or the British because our head of state is still the king now, right? But it's important to set these contexts because we were disenfranchised in 1907 in Canada. It took 40 years to get franchised in Canada. A lot of racist policies, the continuous journey legislation, not the same volume, but equally had, for lack of a better word, a landing tax, not necessarily a head tax, but almost identical concept because the head tax is a landing tax as well, right? That we had to pay five times that of a European person coming. <laughs> the head tax had to pay. Uh, they had uh, they had to pay ten times. So ours was I think two fifty. This was five hundred. I think, if I remember. Now here's the scary part. Nineteen fourteen, a ship arrives on the shores. The very first time Canada as a nation turned away a migrant ship was in 1914, this ship. And these are passengers. And see this passenger right here? His turban is quite different than a number of other ones. That's a military turban. In fact, that's a cavalry regiment turban. These passengers that were turned away, you know what passports they had? British, they were British subjects. We turned away our own subjects for one reason only, the color of the skin. We were serving. Can you imagine turning away somebody that's in service? Anybody recognize who this is? King George V. Folks, if it's fit for a sick, it's fit for a king. And you don't think it's fit for the RCMP? You're kidding me. You're kidding me. But this is the danger that we have to get into this war in Canada because it, uh, history gets erasure or we don't have an accurate representation of what history looks like and feels like. This ship took two months to get here was not allowed to dock, was left in the waters for two months. If you get antsy, because we go over 40 minutes, think about I'm at four months right now. 
And this was not a passenger ship. This was actually a cargo ship. And they're bringing coal to offset the cost. They just not even made up because they couldn't make up enough. There were 376 passengers, not like they had 376 bunk beds or something like that. They got sent back. July 23rd. So if it took two months to get here, it took two months to get back, six months, half a year. July 23rd, the ship gets sent back. Seven days later, the war gets called, August 1914. It took two months for this ship to land in the port of Calcutta where the passengers get shot at. And literally to the day that this ship is docking in Calcutta, there's a ship from the exact same families and brothers and villagers landing in Marseille in France, docking. Not wanted? but wanted and greatly needed. And we still answered the call. We still answered the call. Gentlemen of India marching to chasten German hooligans, says the postcard in translated in France. And you see us carrying the flag there, the French flag. Um, if you really see a number of other pictures we have, because they, they would got off the, the, the ship, boarded a train, got off the train and walked through and marched through the towns with drums and pipes and bugles and carrying the flag and defending this nation with this flag that today I couldn't stand in front of you with my turban on. Boy, the danger and the price of forgetting. And you know, we said we will never forget them. Forget about forget them. We'll treat them as, as worse than second class citizens. The same people that defended this constitution, this land, holding that. And guess what? We're not too far away in Canada as well. Because that's the job I have as a public servant here with the Board of Education, I would not be able to have in Quebec. This is on our doorsteps and it's not about Quebec because Global did a national survey around articles of faith and religious so-called symbols because somehow this is a symbol that I'm wearing on my head. And the rest of Canada wasn't too far off in their position that I shouldn't be holding public sector jobs like a police officer, like a bus driver, like a teacher or any other way to be a proud Canadian and serve. So whose rights were we actually defending when we're here? A great battle of Nouvelle Chapelle at the dedication ceremony, Field Marshal of the Allied Forces Ferdinand Foch said the following to the soldiers, return to your homes in the distant sunbathed east and proclaim how your countrymen drenched with their blood the cold northern land of France and Flanders, how they delivered it by their ardent spirit from the firm grip of a determined enemy. Tell all India that we shall watch over their graves with the devotion due to all our dead. We shall cherish above all the memory of their example. They showed us the way. They made the first steps towards the final victory. Is that how we're perceived? Is that how we're remembered? Is that how we're valued? But yet, this was our deeds. Oh, I pressed the wrong button here, technology. Sorry about that. I think I'm good looking, but I will have to admit, Mr. Hardik Singh Malik is a little bit sharper than me. The very first Sikh 
pilot who served in World War I. His book, A Little Work, A Little Play, the forward of the book, the forward of the book says, I consider it an honor and a privilege to write the forward to the memoirs of an old and valued friend. It goes on, nice paragraph says, my friendship with the author goes back many years. During World War I, we we're both officers in the role of flying corps. Later, we found ourselves as students together at Oxford, and we both shared a love of sports, for which I liked ice hockey and he liked cricket and golf. Anybody know who his best friend was and who served with him in World War I and hung out with him at Oxford and played sports? Served with him. If you're flying out of Toronto, you will fly out of the last to be Pearson, wrote the forward to his book. Yeah. And guess who the commander was? One of the most decorated, Bishop is one of the, uh, quite decorated, but the most decorated World War I, and I believe Victoria Cross Willie, uh, I almost gave it away, Victoria Cross winner was their commander, William Barker. Barker. Yeah. Served under William Barker. Now I'm going to tell you an interesting story about him. <laughs> so he served as part of the British Army, not the British Indian Army he was in England. But what had happened is he first wanted to serve and they said, no. So I said, fine. And he was so determined that he went to the war on his own. He went on his own to the war and he ended up volunteering as an ambulance driver. So they're just hanging out, driving around, talking to his fellow Frenchmen. And they say, what's up? What's up? What are you up to? What do you do? I can fly. Then why are you driving? Why, why aren't you flying? I'm going to get you flying. And they got him into the France Army, uh, 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 Air Force. So he's excited. He calls up his friends and colleagues and says, I'm going to be flying. Right? They go, no, 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 no. Don't fly for them. Come back, fly for us. So then the British took him. And a gentleman that's a statesman, an athlete. I got, I got pictures of him golfing, trying to make the cut in the US at Pinehurst. World-class cricketer, statesman, academic, president of Patiala. And in 1947, India's first high commissioner to Canada. I can't think of a more like, phenomenal sick of the last century in terms of his contributions. He's actually also received the highest civilian order in France, the Legion d'Honneur. Bolle Sonihal. Interesting. Book and thing? Yeah. This was the card that was sent to his family asking what should be put on his grave marker. You see what it says? Interesting. Mention Bukham Singh. Pretty good story. But how about Gujarsing? Was actually the first to enlist in Canada. And this marker is actually in, in uh, France. Quite interesting that there's a sixth script on this grave marker. Okay. Really fascinating. We actually have technically four, for lack of a better word, it could be more than that now because as we've been advancing some of the knowledge and stuff like that, for example, at Smith Falls, where some of, some of these six soldiers signed their attestation papers, we got like Lechman Singh and William Singh's uh, name engraved on the cenotaph and stuff. So there's starting to become more, but if we're talking about directly World War I related 
Um, there's there's four in total, Bukham Singh, only one in Canada, and then there's in, in Belang, and, and um, so Belgium and France. And every single one of them is interesting because Bukham Singh's too, the Satsavik all wasn't on there and stuff. Um, his has no cross, so no cross was on there. Um, but Lechman Singh's has a cross on it. And Gurdjieff Singh is missing the maple leaf that's on the top of all Canadian six world judges like Bookham's has on there, right? And so, but then the other two don't have the six script, which should have been both on Bookham Singh's and Lechman Singh's and stuff, right? So even if you just want to look through those kind of layers, it's just fascinating in terms of all the just nuggets and details as you go through, but that wasn't their priority. The priority at that time was just to honor the fallen, right? Um, and, and so that's, that's what we see around over here, piece itself. Um, postcard, original postcard. We have over 800 original postcards alone as part of our collection at the museum from World War I alone. Um, Sons of Empire, Canada, India, Australia. A whiskered postcard. And this is Ishard Singh, the very first Sikh to win a Victoria Cross. And it's part of the not directly holdings, because the museum is not trying to hold anything. The problem with museums generally is that, for example, the ROM, at any given time, only about 3% of holdings are ever exhibited. And I might have a passion on one area. And it, they might come up, and then once I'm gone, that area, that con that passion may never see the light of day for 200 years. So, in fact, when we did uh, an exhibition, the Artistic Kingdoms in 1999, we found some artifacts from the 1800s that the Ram didn't even know it had until they started kind of, you know, we were going through some of the holdings and list and key identifiers and stuff and found things, all right. And so that will happen. So we're not trying to be in that business. We're trying to be in the business. Uh, we have we, we have tons of artifacts because because for us, uh, our first priority are to, is to be collectors. And the reason being is because our history and artifacts should be in our hands. We shouldn't be dependent on the ROM. If today, if I wanted to bring, because we have the actual ribbon bar of the very first six to win the Victoria Cross, we have that ribbon bar. All right, I could have brought it today. Well, I technically wanted to. It's in our hands. So we're not dependent on somebody to access our own history and heritage. And we know what's again happening with the indigenous community in terms of reparations and stuff around artifacts and stuff. And so, um, yeah, we, we uh, Gurmeet Singh uh, and his brother, uh, Satnam Singh, uh, have that exact one that's shown in the picture, the one and only ribbon bar. And for anybody that loves military, I call this the soldier's DNA, right? Because as we know, a part of military history is, generally speaking, you can literally tell every single campaign just by the ribbon bar. It's the DNA of that soldier. You can just write down every single campaign. Yep, that's the Victoria Cross. That's from this place. That's from this place. That's from this campaign and that campaign. You don't need the actual medal itself. That's the DNA right over there, right? And so it's just fascinating. Um, some images from uh, World War II, um, you know, uh, I have some pictures with, with, with uh, 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 the six and, and the Canadian military as well um, at, at certain different times. Even in World War I, uh, on our website, if you go, uh, Vimy, the Battle of Vimy, we were there, the Lahore Division was part of the Vimy Ridge Line, the Canadians, right? But again, this erasure has consequences because if I were to even just shit, generally, I remember one year I was, I was getting some packaging material for the posters because I was sending it to a friend out in Vancouver and the gentleman was looking at me and he goes, oh yeah, what are those posters? And I said, uh, for us, he goes, where? I go in the war. He goes, you served? Right, because we've never seen an image. So where would somebody even have some social capital to even know and identify any of those aspects? And, and so that's why these types of pieces are, are we, when we publish pieces around here, it was interesting because even like, again, there's so much nuggets 
uh, when I was talking about the discrimination and stuff, women were not allowed to join their husbands. Families were not allowed to come. It was when Borden was at the Imperial War Conference at the cabinet, Imperial War Cabinet there, 1919. He was challenging questions to say, why do you got these uh, continuous journey laws and everything else? Look at the service that, that was just given. And these are the same people you're discriminating. That's when the laws got changed here in Canada to allow women and children and families to join. And so the impact of that service, and we will still get, people are telling us tales that, that, that my grandfather said, if you're, if, if, if you're ever in trouble, find a sick. They said, those are the only people I would trust in the world. And so even in those early days, the early 1900s too, the ones that served with six in any balance are new and were, were advocates and allies. Um, but unfortunately it wasn't too far and few between relative to the size and other, other, other uh, attitudes of, of that time. And as early as the United Nations gets formed, we're serving in the UN. And who helped create the UN? All right. Pearson. All right. Are you in soldiers? And not just for Canada, not for the US, this is US. But these are not still without struggle because racism still is present in 2023. Check this story out. He is still advocating for six to join different parts of the US military, army, navy, and what have you. And can you believe that they are still refusing to so-called give exemptions to six to serve with a beard. And I'll tell you how crazy that is. Leave us out of this and watch this. Let's just pretend no six are even applying. The US military every year without us offers over 30,000 exemptions for beards of its current force. You remember the Komogatamaru story? We were British subjects. What gives? This gives. So I offer over 30,000 exemptions in the military right now, but somebody who is an, as an article of faith, I can't give an exemption to, but I offer 30,000, something is not right. Uh, one day when I think I'm going to have time in life, I'll love to have another action figure, G.I. Singh. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the, ah, I love, you love the picture? Love Pretty cool. Ugh. Good friend of mine was the one who invited me out to the Pentagon as well to speak there. And, um, but just share, and he's a medic. He, he's, he's a medic in the, in, the, in the U.S. Army. And he's often said, you know, when I'm serving the wounded, they don't care what's on my head. <laughs> yeah. We got to kind of remind people sometimes, but guess what? Too many people do care. Too many people do care. And there's great young sick women serving in Canada and the Canadian forces and in the US and in England and Australia. So um, shout out to that service as well. Harjeet. Again, I, I can do stories after stories because the, the militia and the regiment that was used to keep the passengers in the ship at bay in 1914 was the Duke of Connaught's. Who became the lead of the Duke of Connaught's? Rajit did, 100 years, over 100 years later, right? Then obviously, Minister of Defense uh, for Canada. It was a great pride uh, moment. And it's interesting because somehow, you know, there was, there was that challenge that people were talking about um, his service and everything else. And yet he didn't do anything wrong. And in fact, he has condom, uh, the, the, he's, cause he's received a number of military awards and stuff. And, and, and there's the paper documentation for it in terms of what those pieces are. 
and yet still gets questioned, right? And there are individuals in the Canadian military as we speak today that have actually committed crimes and, 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 and we're not even blinking or challenging anything over here. So I just wanna be mindful still to the disproportionality of individuals and, 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 uh, and really at the end of the day, the racism and discrimination that happens, um, even when people reach uh, great, uh, uh, great milestones and, and, and places that, that these are the challenges we still have to keep up with. Um, but, you know, we're gonna keep on forwarding. These are uh, it was about five or six years ago, the Royal Military, uh, uh, right? The RMC, right? And out of Kingston, um, they're, they've all graduated now. Uh, but a great piece there. My dad worked for Kellogg's, by the way. Not why I had his piece, but this is this is a, a all wheat uh, shreddies card for Kellogg's in Canada that was part of the uh, cereal boxes. Number thirteen, I guess it's good. Teran teran, eh? We like that one, eh? There's an inside joke for the Sikh community, for not a joke, but thirteen, because thirteen is actually lucky for us. I know for others it might not be, but it's quite lucky for us. Um, so it's peoples of the world, Sikhs have the reputation of being the bravest soldiers in the world. So you remember what I was talking about the 1840s that were being spoken about, right? This is what was still going on in the 1930s and 40s here in Canada. They come from Northern India and I talked about the Punjab region, Northern India there itself and are very good looking. Thank you very much. <laughs> Always appreciated and welcomed. Tall, sorry, only part I fail at, <laughs> uh, I think. With light skin, they have flashing eyes and hawk-like noses, do we not? <laughs> they, wear, they wear beards and a long mustache and all of them wrap their heads in turbans. The Sikhs ride and shoot well. Yeah, great cavalry. I got some phenomenal photos of us at, uh, as cavalry and in fact, uh, part of the musical ride of the RCMP uh, gets uh, pieces from the uh, cavalry regiments. And even, even uh, Sam Brown helped to find out where the origins come from and who Sam Brown is. Lots of, lots of history. A great many are in the Imperial forces. And a little bit of my toy soldiers. I always say, and there's a quote I remember at the ROM when we were doing an exhibit one time, it said, toy soldiers never die, they just get dented. And so thank you very much for the time. Uh, and I'm uh, available to answer questions and comments. And uh, I hope we just learned a little bit more and can kind of uh, all walk around a little bit prouder as Canadians. Um, If you want to learn a little bit more about me, uh, party.ca, you can see the website right there uh, is my web page. And if you want to learn a little bit more uh, about six, uh, you can visit the Sick Heritage Museum of Canada page. And if you actually want to really touch artifacts, give us a call. We're uh, open by appointment and would welcome to host. And if you want to even have more fun, call me out again and we can do things out here as well because we, we don't see ourselves as a traditional museum model where you have to come to us. Um, we like to be nimble and, and get out to community as well. So uh, thank you very much for the time. Thank, thank you so much. It was, it was wonderful. Reminded me, my, my father was a veteran of the Second World War, and uh, your talk reminded me of some of the stories you had of serving besides six soldiers. That um, he said, we always we had six on our on our flank. We didn't have to worry about that flank. We knew we were, we were safe and guarded there. So it just brought it back to me that this, yeah. the, the the bravery and and the, the service that they received. So does mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any questions. I, I don't, um, so. I mean, this, this is sort of something that we hear about, so maybe you can shed some light on it. But given the fact that there was some discrimination in reference to, you know, identity piece and all that kind of stuff, but 
when the battles are occurring, are, are ratios in death as well, were they also sort of outweighed as well in the sense of do we go to the front lines more often or the worst for front lines as, as uh, there's no other lines we're on. <laughs> to tell you the truth, right? And I think, just to be fair, all soldiers were pretty much front line. There was there was not much left around there. But 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 in all theaters of the war, in all aspects, I mean, the artifacts that we have of of, of a signalmen, artillery, cavalry, like you just name two in terms of the, the layers of participation. Um, but this this is the fascinating story I, I, I share with people that that the Sikh community, per capita, if we're just looking at a community per capita were probably one of the largest per capita serving communities in World War I and II, yet people have never even seen an image of us. And that's, 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 that's sad, right? And so, so yeah. Um, I'm a little confused with the timeline. So if you're talking about the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, British India uh, wars of the 1840s, right? yeah. and then, Johnny McDonald, some 20 years later, is writing a letter about how wonderful the six, the six are. Yeah. Uh, so that's only a 20, 25 year span. Right? Yeah. So when and how, when and how did the British decide that, okay, well, these people are no longer our enemies that we're fighting against, we're going to use them as allies? Well, for lack of a better word, the British had control of, of all of so called India. There was only one landmass, the Northwest frontier, which was the Sikh kingdom, the Sikh empire that they, that they had to annex. And so they fought those two wars. And once they got that, they, 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 the empire was the total, total landmass. 1947 is when the British left and it became Pakistan and India. And technically, I, I know some people will say there was slightly another place. India didn't get partitioned in 1947, Punjab got partitioned. That partition went right through the middle heart of Punjab and, and, and watch this geopolitics, stopped. Where did it stop? At Kashmir. That's why you're hearing all the geopolitical conflict that's still present today around Kashmir because it went and stopped. Where they're saying it should go right same, keep that line going. It gave us part of it over here to the Pakistan side and the rest of the India. But Punjab, I know there was another part of partition there, but but when that partition happened, technically speaking, Punjab got partitioned in 1947. And so, so all this up to that point, World War I, World War II, we're, we're technically talking British India all that time. So my question is, is similar, but kind of from the other, from the other standpoint. So the, the six were, obviously oppressed and colonized by the British in the 1840s, what turned them to become supporters of the British army and fight on behalf of the British? How did they, why did they? They didn't switch. Turn? They didn't switch and they never turned. This, 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 is, this is, we were just functioning citizens of the government of our time. And it was no different than when the Mughals ruled or when, when, when other nationalities ruled and other rulers were there. It was just a different ruler, a different ruler. And, but where we stood, where we stood now, and, and I love this question because that's a point, you know, because people think, cause, cause, <laughs> and why I say this, you remember I was talking about the so-called mutiny? Sometimes some people want to frame it as India's first war of independence and stuff. <laughs> And then they're challenging of saying, well, so-called, why did you side with the British? We didn't side with anybody. That, that's just the government of our time, right? And watch this. If you're gonna challenge us for where, we, where our position was in, in, in 1857, go back eight years and ask everybody else, where were they when the Anglo-Sikh wars were going on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now you're trying to tell us? It doesn't work that way. And so, and so the six, and why I say this is how we entered the war. 1919, the Jalim on the Bog happened. For India's independence, disproportionately again, even in military service, we represented 2% of the population, but over 
much over 100 percent in like of our proportionality in, in, in the army. The, the sacrifices and casualties for, for the so-called war of independence up to 1947, six. And so we don't technically care because we're not ruled by this concept of, of democracy and government per se. We're ruled by our sovereign conscious and even gender sovereignty, because because I, I I use the term thing in terms of speaking of soldiers, and I think uh, the sovereign sick women in this room will also share with you they use core. So even not even just gender equality, gender sovereignty. And so so we're not in a better position today with the current government in India. But are we serving in the military? Yeah. Right? And so, and so our duty and our obligations are not negated by who is in there because we will still fight that battle as well. And we are. And we've done it through our whole history as a people. We've done it through our, no matter what that ruler is, our duty and obligation to, to society and, 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 and rights and service and civic engagement, you, you're gonna get that in spades. I don't care who our government is or what country we're living in, right? And we will battle those battles as much as possible because we, we, we're fighting these battles. We're, we're still entering the war and we're disenfranchised and we're gonna, and it took us 40 years to get that kind of, but we're still gonna be serving because we can make the same argument then. Now you guys, you guys are disenfranchised and don't have these rights. Why are you guys serving for Canada? We're not serving Canada. We're serving our duty. And why I say that is um, there's a great resource that you can find online and I'll encourage everybody to have this because these are must have type of books, especially within our own households and stuff. It's called uh, Duty, Honor and Is It, right? Uh, by a good friend, colleague of mine, Stephen Pierwall. Um, and and it, it, it speaks to, 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 to some of that piece of the duty, honor and is it. And that's, that's where our service comes from. And it's never been about turning and siding with, uh, we, we, we can serve as a sovereign people and we can hate our government every single day of the week, right? If, if you want to put it lightly, right? Yeah, 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 right? Because again, similar to that other piece, that's where that other connotation I was telling you comes in where people are saying we're so-called slaves or we turned or we sided with, uh, we, we side with justice, we side with human rights, right? We side with, with, with duty. So that's why earlier you said that every single time that stand up is a song. Yeah. Go to France uh, and you see the graves and other war memorials and stuff, and you'll see sing, 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 sing. Every single one that even served for Canada, sing. Every single one. Lechman sing, Wariam sing, uh, uh, Gujar sing, Bukhan sing, Hari sing. I am finding this difficult, like what other people find. We think we are independent, even independent. I am literally saying if someone comes to oppose, I will not say it's a government, it's no. This is what we are taught uh, to stand for human rights, to stand for justice. I will not just to say it's my justice, for justice for everyone. So now I'm thinking what other people are signing, like there were English people, what they were signing, they were, they were not sorry. So don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no, people are just signing. Uh, so uh, now uh, I'm thinking like by will, people are uh, even the English people are thinking themselves as uh, slaves. They have this in their mind. And no. Uh, maybe no. 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 It's 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 uh um uh anybody that serves is sacrificing. Anybody that serves is sacrificing. The example I gave was, was not to create anything related to an us and them. It was just talking about a positionality of a people. And, and because like, so for example, when the passengers came and were being turned back, they're saying, turn back to where? Because that's not home, that's British India. So we can't call that home, technically speaking. Right. And so, and so 
but but our, our gurus had taught us it's not about geopolitics and homes it's about sovereignty of thought sovereignty of conscience that you're going to engage and that's where our true sovereignty comes from right it's hard sometimes to fulfill some of those obligations when every single part of your identity and being and heritage and lived experience is getting erased and compromised as what continues to happen with the Sikh community, right? But that's the beauty of what we're supposed to rise with. And, and because this, what, what's happening geopolitically to us is not the first time in, in, in our history either, right? But, but so interesting from a concept of us as a people that I just want to share that piece to, to, to talk about those aspects of where, because it, like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't something that, that was far from our mind at any given time of, of not just what was happening to us in British India, but for anybody living in that landmass around that time. We wanted so-called freedom, azadi, right? Um, and you know the gather movement, and I can go on and talk about many different things, right? So yeah, but but service is service, service is service. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions, reflections? You know, and 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 this is this is just like like just think about the names of, of a Churchill and a Pearson and McDonald and William Hall, and the interconnectedness of these these these. Uh, names and stories and people in Flanders, right? It would be different now when in Flanders feels the poppies grow low and low, because that's what I said when Don Cherry. Well, he said a lot of things. <laughs> I just I just paraphrased just the, the part of you people come to our country uh, and enjoy our milk and honey. And um, it was about wearing the poppy. And, and uh, if there's anybody who knows about the blood in Flanders as, 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 as uh, oh, it's not even on the right page, as, as Mr. Uh, Ferdinand Fosch had said, um, it's, 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 uh, it's, it, it, it's a whole different, um, How your countrymen drenched with the blood, the cold northern land of France and Flanders. We know poppies. We know Flanders. <laughs> Our blood is there. Yeah. And so to try to and talk about milk and honey, because we have a phenomenal Canadian author in Rupi Kaur. Yeah. The title of her first book, Milk and Honey. Right. So, um, but, but, but this, this, is, this, is, this is why this is needed. Um, because the time of the RCMP and the pictures I've shown you of King George and stuff, um, my ability, uh, because of what I know, to, to challenge Don Cherry um, from, from a hotel bed. I was in Winnipeg doing, doing a presentation, and I woke up, just had the TV on in the background, and, and, I, and I heard those, and I literally ran down to the business uh, little computer they had at the hotel and and I acted on it in fact I got somebody to take a picture of me in the lobby with the poppy on and I sent it to a friend because I'm not a techie and um, and then started writing some of it up they crash after 15 minutes because there's just supposed to be a business a service computer thing throw it back on gmail call my friend up I say I'm going to start dictating and then just get it out on Facebook and stuff within 20 minutes becomes national news um, and stuff and rightfully so Right, rightfully so, because the, the, the minute we let that kind of fodder go, it, to, to be honest, it compromises the safety of people who look like me. Oh, yeah. But it wasn't just sick people who were objecting to what he had said. It was you know, many, many, many people, people were very were, upset. You know, those words. Very yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but what, what, when I'm saying that, the impact of his words has a direct impact on the streets of people who look like me because people will yeah. say, where are your poppy? Or where's your poppy, yeah. right? I would get that. So, so, so even if you and I were both against Don Cherry, nothing's gonna happen to you if you don't have your poppy on, <laughs> right? Right, yeah. Um, but, but I'm just saying in terms of, and, and you know, yeah, we had people chime in, but, but, but we had to take and really speak to because, because, because those, those, those who, 
when we and why and why part of this presentation why some of those pictures because i still haven't shown you the great pictures of, of of us working the lumber mills and sawmills and the railroads in canada and all the rest of it it's because because when when are we going to start using the terminology of of uh uh of, of settlers and even pioneers i don't really like to use that around reconciliation because to claim that that we're pioneers or anybody else pioneers in 1908 <laughs> when the indigenous peoples of Canada, you know what I mean? The pioneers of, of, of the land. But, but if I were to still take it in that so-called just academic war, when, when do we get the social capital of being called pioneers? And why not? And then I'll even tell you today what the, what the challenge is. What's your name, young boy? Father? Beer Bahadur. Beer or beer? Beer Bahadur. My father-in-law's name was Bahadur. Right? Um, and, and so what's, what's uh, there was a time I was, my son's name is Saya, but I was, I wanted to actually call him Thig and use his middle name as Bahadur. So I'm just going to call you Bahadur for now, if you don't mind. Bahadur, you want to just come stand up over here? <laughs> Father, where were you born? <laughs> in Brandon, Canada. Here, yeah. If I were to take Bahadur to any school in Ontario and ask them, how would you identify this young kid? Would you think they'll say Indian or Canadian? Probably Indian. Probably Indian. What do you think? You have to say <laughs> if I were to ask a young student to draw a picture of a, of, of a Canadian, would this be the default? I forget elementary. I've gone to high schools as part of the Dominion Institute Speaker Series and many others, and just even on talks I do on my own. And I've asked, even up to, because you would think that kids, as you know, the older you're going to get and be into grade 10, that they might have a different vision of, of what uh, inclusion kind of looks like. And I asked them, do Canadians wear turbans? And they laughed. We have a lot of issues still. We cannot continue to other each other. There are prices to pay. Because as long as we don't think, even in grade 10, that Canadians wear turbans, I can walk the streets with all the maple syrup I have. I can wear the jersey of every single Canadian hockey team. I can mourn the loss of the Canadian women's hockey team. And it won't make me Canadian. I can be born here. And somebody can just be visiting from the US who's white. And if I were to put a young white boy who's the exact same age as you, and I say, who's the Canadian? I know where the default would go. And so these are the other pieces of the language we use and how we identify people and who gets the social capital of being identified as Canadian and who doesn't and why are even deeper layers of what we're trying to engage as part of the conversation of this presentation. Any other thoughts and reflections? Um, yeah. I'm just gonna say, uh, as you were sort of talking about Rachel, um, sort of done, Sharing sort of comments are actually reflective of that as well, in the sense that um, if there is sort of lack or maybe reduction in in, in Sikhs wearing uh, um, you know poppies, is is also not understanding really how they relate to to the poppy, right? As Sikhs. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, so it I... sort of comes like full circle the dangers of, of racial a hundred percent and that's that's part of what what I wrote uh, back um, nineteen oh eight picture sharply dressed men I'm always competing first with Hardy Simolik <laughs> now with these Great lucky pioneers, right? When there's horse carriages and buggies and streetcars, 1908, right? In Canada. And, and, and so this is, this is um, 
th th this, this is part of the challenge that we continue to have as part of uh, just our day to day conversations and and. Uh, um, No, that was uh, didn't go out right. I'm just going to see if I can get. Uh, I'll just leave that for now, just up there that way. Um, yeah. So in the First World War. Yep. This is my naivety, but within the Canadian Army. Yep. Did so did Sikh soldiers Sikh soldiers serve in the line units with the Canadian Army or were they associated with the British and the Army? No, they're in the line army. The line. And here's a funny, interesting tale that you have asked because the only reason why Wariam Singh's letter exists, because it was written in the Sikh script of Gurmukhi, right? So, so uh, no, no different than literally any other soldier letter technically coming around. They're not allowed to ever write about what's happening because if it gets intercepted and stuff, they know what's going on. So they're only allowed to write about three or four weeks ago, so to speak, right? And literally anything still going out was, was read, right? Because they just want to know, uh, are you upset? Are you, you know, maybe if the Germans intercept your letters and you're just talking about, oh, I'm tired and I think we're going to lose this war. Like who knows what you're writing and your feelings and stuff. And so, you know, for lack of a better word, your letter might even be censored. And, and even if it's going back to your own family for, excuse me, a number of different reasons. Where well, Emstein's letter only exists because it's mislabeled right now sitting in the archives in England as part of the British Indian Army letters. But it says Canadian Experimental Force. <laughs> so like, you know what I mean, right? And so that's the only reason it exists by accident um, because it was, it was written in a language that they automatically by default assumed it was not a Canadian soldier writing it, right? It was probably part of the British Indian Army. So in the First and Second World War, the Sikh soldiers didn't wear helmets. No. Nope. So when within the Canadian Army did, did, did this become a commonplace they would? Or do they not? No. Because I noticed that the, the medic from the yeah. United States Army yeah. clearly wore a helmet. No. Nope. No, he did not. No, nope. he just had he just had one hanging off the side there, ah, like stylish. Excuse my English. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, now, now that's nuanced, relatively speaking, in the sense that um, uh, there may be some uh, sex who choose, and it's not for me to 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 speak about. Uh, spirituality, theology, integrity, or what have you and stuff. Um, and the reality for me is, uh, you know, if I'm gonna walk on Mars, I might have something over my head and around my suit, relatively speaking. I may try to choose not to, I don't know how long I'm gonna live. Um, but but, but that, that, that right to, to, to sovereignty, I mean, because I, I'm, I'm gonna be relatively honest, Con concepts of helmets, even including motorcycles, in part public policy, the, if, if you really want to put a probability of risk to injury and saving a life, I, I can give you stories of saving a life. I can give you stories of turbine saving a life from bullets. But the reality is, is I can have the most beautiful, in fact, sparkle it with 24 karat gold. And if I get hit here with a bullet, ah, uh, did we hear what, we, what was said? If I get here, here with a bullet, say it nice and loud, just the way you said it. I can't say that word. Oh, say it. No, no, because it's passionate. It's artistic the way you said it. That's what I want it. What the heck good is a helmet? Yeah, what the heck good is a helmet, right? And so when you really look at it through those lenses, we shouldn't be wasting our time trying to figure out, this, these are tanks and bombs, isn't that? This, what's on my head is not gonna, like realistic and, and, and I say that because boy I, I honestly if, if if people want to be challenging I, I might I could be here for two hours if you just want to talk about the motorcycle helmet and the reason reason I'm saying that is because I can close the conversation very quickly too by saying why are we even arguing I'm just going to go across the border and there's a couple of states in the U.S. that don't don't even have a helmet law so why are you arguing with me around an exemption 
I didn't say get rid of the whole helmet law in Ontario. Did I? No, right? And so, and so what is it? And, and if anybody that rides will know when you take the course, the safety course, they say literally when it was on our desks, they say, you know, pretty much that's even higher than your, than, than your motorcycle seat. But if the helmet falls ever, uh, you should go and buy a new one, they've always told us in that class. Because no helmet manufacturer is going gonna, is gonna to certify safety, oh, yeah. <laughs> not even on damage, of the actual one undamaged for anything over a speed of maybe 30 or 35 kilometers. Of, of they'll take some responsibility. Because again, riding, don't wear a helmet, put yourself in an enclosed vehicle. Do you get injured and die? Ah, same argument in terms of the motorcycle piece. The probability of risk to injury traveling 30 to 35 kilometers on a motorcycle for anybody, helmet or not, minimal. The probability of risk of death, helmet or not, traveling at 100 kilometers an hour, same. The, the, the helmet itself, in of itself, does not really increase uh, any numbers on either one of those variables. Right on that sense. Now, this is not stopping me having an exemption for a helmet gives me a choice. It's not stopping from you if you feel secure, happy, safe, or whatever from wearing it. So then what's the issue? What's the issue at hand? And why I say these things is because I didn't bring the t-shirt from the museum if you come. I have a t-shirt made locally that says, Ride a motorcycle, wear a helmet. Ride a camel, wear a turban. There's issues. There are issues here. The RCMP, the, the amount of artifacts I have related, and but they just get mail saying there's a bullet with your name on it. The racist pins leading up to the decision. And then even after it says, Turbans approved, I think March 15th, 1990, but not accepted. Turbans approved, March 15th, 1990, a sad day for Canada. My boxing story, which I haven't shared over here, there are people from the Canadian Amateur Boxing Association that are gonna go to their graves, go to their graves and still not accept the right for me to compete with my beard as a boxer in Canada. Go to their graves, although the decisions have been clearly done. And in fact, if anybody watched the last Olympics, they completely opened it up for anybody. If they watched it, I went nuts on there. My coach was there. I was taking pictures on my TV. I said, what the hell just went on? Because this was beyond brand new. And I, somebody actually tried killing me here in Canada. What gives? What gives? What gives? What gives? We have to be mindful of what gives and the whys because it, it, it hasn't stopped and it needs to stop. And we need to step back. We need to reflect. We need to engage. We need to ask. Yeah. Could you bring up the slide of the um, uh, soldiers from RMC? Yep. Please, I'd like to ask a question. Sure. <clears throat> They on on their turban. Yep. Yep. The 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 gold. Do these or, have a name? This has this cross yep. and. Does the different colors? So these ones, it's, it's just the shadows that's going on here. They're all wearing literally the, the gold color. It's just a reflection of the sun, right? That this, the sun is kind of hitting here. So it's shining it up, but, but they're all identical. Um, and again, just the nuance piece, because you will also have uh, some six who are serving that say, uh, no, this is an article of faith. And for lack of it, we're not going to badge it with anything. And then someone will do it. So, so what you will see is, um, uh, so, so I'll show you. I'll show you a quick variation, and I'm gonna unfortunately disclose some things about me, um, but that's okay. Uh, and it's gonna be a quick uh, picture, I think. Um, uh, 
I, I don't remember, so I'm just gonna do it quickly here on that page. Uh, on the far left, the first image you're gonna see right there. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, it, it'll scroll back. Um, so, so I was actually the first one to peel with a turbine. And um, so if, if you see officers who have a hat, they, you, you will see constables have the red strip around their hat. And then inspectors, what we call the brass, the higher brass were yellow and stuff. Uh, I, I had chosen to wear that as part of what we might define as the 50, so to speak, right? On, on that triangular part of it. Almost every single officer today that's serving appeal doesn't want to wear it there and they wear it over like you had seen in the RMC uh, image piece itself, right? I'm not getting into those nuanced challenge of battles, but that's, that's what you would see in terms of where or how uh, they're putting it on as part of that piece. Cause it technically also signifies in, in part a rank, right? So on the officer, when you see predominantly red, uh, that's usually a constable uh, class. And then the, and I think it's, uh, cause I don't even think staff sergeants were yellow. I think it's inspector and above, uh, right? Right. Yeah, right. Uh, around those pieces. So um, yeah, that, that's just a little bit about uh, what that piece and, and the turban piece. And so you get variations, you'll get variations in terms of turban styles here and colors and all the rest of that neat stuff. Where do you get your um, toy soldiers? Toy soldiers, yeah. So what's interesting is uh, pretty much every single major manufacturer of toy soldiers uh, uh, has made different uh, sick toy soldier sets. So King and Country, uh, one of the larger makers of, of to current toy soldiers and stuff, lots of them. Uh, there's a couple of uh, uh, the, uh, World War II ones, nice ones and stuff. Um, got, yeah, Marlboro, um, I mean, you just pretty much name a toy soldier manufacturer and I could probably name you some sets uh, from those. So um, harder to, uh, to, to, to really get now auction sites, um, collector sites is where it would pick up, but, but too hard to find on just Kijiji and, and Facebook marketplace. You, there's not, you won't see them as readily available in those kind of places, right? But um, yeah, yeah. I can remember being a kid having no, that's 65 years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're still getting, yeah. And so, so there's like, because even uh, this year, there's a couple of new sets that just came out, right? So, um, yeah. 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 Fun stuff. Uh, and, and not just, not just military related, related to events like, like the great Dilly the Bars, right? And so veteran sets, uh, sets of, of, of some of the sick princely states of Patiala and gin and a whole bunch of lots of interesting uh, types of sick toy soldiers. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, what's the, um, the tin soldiers, the Marks US company, you remember, right? Yeah, that, that, that you used to so-called knock them over and get points of. So there's actually uh, one of the runs cause they had a whole bunch of different regiments and there were points on there was the 15th Lithiana six. And so when, you, when it gets knocked over it says 15 on there as the points as well which is also the number of the regiment itself. Right, so yeah, a lot, lot of interesting places uh, you would find uh, these pieces. And then, then you just get, you know, collecting is, is, is a crazy rabbit hole. Yeah, there's a blue one, a yellow one, one facing left, one facing right. Oh, I didn't see this one. That's a big one, small one, miniature ones, right? But a lot of fun. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah, because those are, yeah. Media, like movies. Yeah. And I haven't seen any, anything I know about, which is working on the railway, the 16 era in the NHL, yeah. and a battle at Arnhem, a bridge too far. Yeah. Anything I see on that stuff is completely wrong. Yeah. No, I don't think it's intentional, but there's nobody around now who knows about that stuff. Yeah, I, and, 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 then, and then now imagine even more uh, in terms of, 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 of that, because now 
when 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 it's not I, I mean there's enough for us in terms of, of of artifacts that we have right that that we can create some pretty pretty accurate pieces but really to get into the nuggets and the juice and everything else, right? That's a compromise. So, so when it's first not even engaged and now having some of us having to so-called find and engage that history hundred years later, it's even more challenging, right? It's even more challenging from, from, from a, a, a historical perspective, right? Um, because it's just like whatever I'm speaking and engaging right now and someone's gonna write about me a hundred years later, it's gonna be that much more harder depending on where they're getting and what they're getting and but what did I really feel? Did I keep a journal of my life? Not really, <laughs> right? And a whole bunch of other pieces, right? So yeah, question in the back. Well, I was just going to add to that. It may not be an intention of writing. It's simply that it's a tenant. The tenant problem is there in that. Yes, yeah. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Right where it's, some of the challenges are, right? And that's where um, we, I've enjoyed the journey, my friends and colleagues, when we're looking at those pieces, because for us, it's not just, oh, that's a beautiful picture of the passion of the Komogatamaru and the gentleman who charted the ship. And when we're looking at that, we say, oh my God, look, that's, that's a cavalry regiment turbine. It's black all on one side, it's, it's red, and we're looking closer. And, and even just like, like the, the, the one we showed of them, um in, in a procession here in canada with that there's actually three of them i have a black and white picture of that same one too and when i look close enough i can see three of those turban badges on them right and that's not the only one we have right but but and we know enough in terms of for some of these pieces but oh yeah it's it, it just fascinating um and and we're gonna we're gonna keep uh pushing this out so that it can for lack of a better word become a normalized net new uh, experience for us right uh for sure yeah yeah how many six are in the opp in the opp itself right now uh um well, I'm trying, like, like i don't know the exact numbers um and the reason i'm laughing at because even voltage with the rcmp officer mm -hmm. he's retired from the rcmp <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> and so and so 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 friends of mine who i know who even served in our uh in the opp have have even retired now so who are the young people in peel and opp and toronto it's a new generation yeah. all right it's a new generation so yeah thank you no thank you Rukata. oh everybody's been so well a lot of questions right yeah sure i can more, yeah. this is our, our last military lecture of, of the season we will be starting up again in September uh, with a lot, uh, another batch of, of amazing speakers like the one we have tonight. Uh, so thank you everyone for coming tonight and I uh, hope we see you at the museum again. Thank you.